Hi, I'm Malika Bilal, and you're in the stream. Today, a wave of African Americans are choosing to move to the African continent. But why, and what happens when they get there? Join the conversation using the hashtag AJStream, or if you're watching live on YouTube, you'll eventually see us in that box. You can leave your comments in the chat box, and you too could be in the stream. My name is Chimamanda Aduchi. I am a writer, and I am in the stream. In recent years, thousands of African Americans have made the decision to, quote, return home to the African continent. Many say they want to escape the racial pressure pot of the United States, while some want to connect to the land of their ancestors. For others, countries like Ghana wooed them with an easy immigration process and the promise of a better life. Though many in African countries are welcoming of the Americans in their midst, not everyone is thrilled by their new neighbors. So joining us to talk about all of this in Accra, Ghana, Mohamida El Muhajir. She's a marketing and media consultant. She also made the documentary film Black Sit about the migration of African Americans. In Cape Town, South Africa, Lita Sokutu. He's an anthropologist and social literacy consultant. In Namibia, Kaylin Reed Chipanga. She's a journalist and editor of the website African American in Africa. And here in our studio, Barrett Pittner, a writer and journalist focusing on race, culture, and politics in the United States. Welcome to the stream, everyone. So this is a conversation that is very hot with our audience. They love this topic. And so everyone wanted to chime in with why people might want to move to the continent of Africa. This is just one of the tweets we got. This is from Edmund, who says, it's about identity. Events like the slave trade and colonial rule almost wiped away that African identity. And thank goodness, people are once again asking deep questions about that identity. Uh, so, uh, Kaylin, I want to go to you with that idea, talking about the draw of, of what made you want to leave the U.S. and move to Namibia. I have a picture here on my laptop that I pulled up of you not too long ago, <laughs> you teaching uh -oh. English. <laughs> Talk to us about yeah. that experience and, and, and what made it so enticing for you. Um, you know, but basically by the time I was about 23, 24 years old, I personally just became kind of tired and bored of America. Um, and I just really fell in love with the energy and vibrancy that came with uh, black nations, especially after visiting uh, Barbados, which is where I have matrilineal um, lineage. And so I basically decided that, you know, I wanted to experience life on the African continent. And so I, I started doing research on the Internet about ways to move to Africa. And I found out that one of the, the easiest ways was through volunteer teaching. And so I applied to an American organization. And that's how I ended up in Namibia. Um, and, you know, the rest is history. I ended up getting married to a Namibian. I'm now a mother here. But really just for me, it was, you know, I personally was, was kind of unsatisfied with, with American life. Um, and I've always felt a connection uh, just to, to the continent and, um, and to my African ancestry and just to the, the energy of black nations. And so it was really attractive and it's been an, an, an intoxicating experience. So you mentioned that I, I had to chuckle at tired and bored of living in America uh, and the American <laughs> yeah. context, really. Um, so, Mohamed, I want to go to you with that idea. I pulled up on my screen here um, a, 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 an article about you headlined why some African-Americans are moving to Africa. This is from our colleague Azad Issa on the Al Jazeera English site. And you decided to move to Ghana for a one-year fellowship in 2014 and then stayed. What was behind that decision? Well, actually, um, I did graduate school in Ghana in 2003, um, but it, well, I didn't feel like it was time for me to move yet. You know, there are things, lots of things weren't in place, but I came back 10 years later. In 2013, I had an amazing experience. There was so much development that had happened in that time that I was like, now is the time. Um, I applied for a fellowship. Um, it was a one-year fellowship. I figured that would give me enough time to, you know, get the lay of the land, see how much I liked it. And at the end of one year, I was like, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. And um, I've been here since then. Barrett, you heard those two experiences. What goes through your mind when you hear that? Well, it, it makes a lot of sense, and you know, because, frankly, People not being 
enjoying living in the United States or having issues as an African American in, in the United States, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, there's plenty of African Americans who have gone to you know countries in Europe and have felt more comfortable in Europe than they have in America. So going to Africa and feeling you know this this connection to more you know African people, which that doesn't necessarily mean that it's your home per se, where you go back and like you're rekindling something that you you have like a, a very real connection that you you know. You, not saying the connection is completely gone, but the the comfort level and the ability to adapt and thrive in that environment it makes it makes a lot of sense, and so I, I can see why people would be, you know, interested in doing so. Okay, so then I want to throw a little dynamite into this conversation. Uh, here's some people who are not so interested. This is B. McNeil who tweets, "Definitely not. African American blood runs in the veins and sinews of the United States. We should make this country more fair and equitable to people of color." not cut and run, so to speak. We also got a video comment from someone who thinks similarly along those lines, uh, and she's also a, a former stream guest. Serene writes uh, in, uh, sent us his video on this point. Have a listen. As a descendant of American chattel slavery, I don't necessarily feel the need to go back to Africa, a place that I've never been, in order to reconnect with my roots because I feel like my roots are right here in the United States where my ancestors literally gave their lives building this country as enslaved people. They sunk their blood, sweat, and tears into this country and I don't feel it's necessary for me to leave to find my roots. So, Barrett, you, you wrote a piece in 2015 for Daily Beast. I pulled it up here. African Americans can't go home. And, and the title there is Rootless. And this is under the opinion page. But talk to us about that idea that Serene mentioned in her video comment. This is home. This is where her roots are. Yeah, without a doubt, as an African American, this this is our home. Like my my family has been here for generations upon generations, and and I'm as American as, as you can get. But the the complexity of being an African American is that we've never been allowed to have the complete agency to treat this fully as our home in like the true American sense, and that will incline people to go in search of other places where they can feel they can fully exercise their agency and, and be themselves to the fullest. And so that brings about a complexity where you kind of have, as a culture, two environments where you can't be fully home in either one, but you do have an obligation uh, domestically in the United States to, to fight for equity for African Americans. But at the same time, the colonization across the globe has made it so that af black stories, African stories, don't get the representation that they need. And collectively, we have to work to enhance that, too. So it's, it's, it's a fight you know, domestically and, and internationally to elevate black voices and strive for equality across the board. So you can't go home, per se, but you do have a connection to both places that you have to you know, work for the betterment of all black people. Lisa, I want to bring you into the conversation here on that point Baird raised about you can't go home. Um, uh, you work yeah. with students who uh, go to the continent, specifically South Africa, um, and yeah. have different experiences. Can you talk to us about that? Um, in essence, we work with students like American exchange students that come here for study abroad programs, but we've also worked with a lot of American international schools and they are based here in South Africa. And what you often find is there's this desire from the white students to, you know, serve this environment and help Africa in a very romantic sense. But on the flip side, you've got African-Americans who come here and are looking for an idyllic sense of home, an idyllic sense of a reconnection with their roots, which falls a little bit shallow because the, I don't know, the Africa and the, and, and the homeland that you're looking at is messy, complex, and us people that were born and raised, you are still trying to figure out themselves. And so I find that when the desire is very romantic and one that is lacking context of just on the ground what is happening within the country, it, it becomes problematic and at times a little bit difficult for us as local South Africans to engage with you realistically as a foreigner coming into the space to try and find something on this like spiritual mecca it's it's, it's very complicated mm. Caitlin well I think that's kind of like uh first of all I think there's a misconception um that I've seen thrown around that African Americans you know across the board like we don't have any insight you know to what is going on on the ground in African in African nations you know like I there are professors at Howard University that that you know, w which is my alma mater, that I know for a fact are are you know all the way from from D.C. 
deeply engaged um, and aware of, of, of African politics. Of course, being on the ground in an African country, mm -hmm. there's nothing that can replace, you know, and, and also being an African or being a South African, there's nothing that can replace you know, that direct insight. Um, but I think it's a little bit, you know, a little bit of a, a reach to, to sort of just kind of say that, you know, we, we kind of have this shallow understanding, um, you know, uh, or shallow approach, I would say. You know, I don't really think that's the case. And I think sometimes people just kind of underestimate the insight that African-Americans, that many of us actually do have. Um, you know, I get it. A lot of African-Americans don't know, you know, don't have any interest um, in, in what's going on in Africa. But at the same time, there are others that do, like myself, you know. And I think the yeah. least that can be done is to give us a chance. Um, you know, oh, yeah. we're, we're starting, you know, we're starting from, uh, you know, from 400 years, 400 plus years, you know, like you can't expect, I don't think you should expect us to come, you know, and just know everything and just have a lay of the land. That's where, you know, you can meet us halfway and we can all work together and, and get a better understanding. And it won't be perfect and it will be kind of, yeah. you know, um, what, I, what I do, what I do wish to add there, just make a quick caveat is I'm, we welcome people that wish to learn, but mm -hmm. what I'm saying is with the students, which are particularly younger, they come in with a sense of this place will fit in this kind of box of what the motherland looks like. I mean, uh, there are definitely many, many African-American scholars that history has showed us that have a, an acute nuanced awareness of the African continent. Chino Achebe writes about James Bolden and how his perception of, the, of, the, of Africa was nuanced, smart, and in many ways uh, uh, fully aware of how that 400-year history creates a gap of knowledge. So 100%. What I'm saying is the self-interrogation, which is happening from us, locals that are born and raised, needs to be extended, and a desire to learn needs to also occur with those people that are coming inside, if that makes sense. Not, right. I'm, not, I'm, not printing, yeah. I'm not painting with broad strokes at all. Mm -hmm. I, I, hear, you're talking I hear what you're saying. Stuff, right? I hear what you're saying. You mentioned self-interrogation, and I think one of the things that came up in our community is a feeling um, from people on the continent that some Americans are not doing that self-interrogation as accurately and thoroughly as they need to be. Take a look at these two tweets from Lan Ray. Uh, he mentions, first of all, this isn't new, and, and that goes to the idea that the Back to Africa movements have been happening since the 1800s to contemporary times. He says, this is an experiment hundreds of years in the making. I have friends here in Nigeria whose surnames are Fernandez, Da Silva, etc. Their great-grandparents are returnee slaves from Brazil. They all have Yoruba first names, though, and they're completely re-assimilated. He goes on to say, I haven't come across any of them in Lagos, and frankly, I wouldn't advise them to come here. Nigeria is where dreams come to die. They'll be quickly disillusioned. In Ghana, they might find more to their taste because of its economic climate and low population. So there's one naysayer there, but I want to give that one to you, Mohamida, because I'd like you to give us an idea of what happens when you land. It can't all be rosy. What does that look like? What should people expect? Um, I think, you know, it's important for African Americans to manage expectations. You know, we have like all this yearning inside, you know, this displacement, and we want it to go away, you know, and we think when we land, it's going to magically go away. There are going to be drummers and singers at the airport welcoming us. You know, it's just not like that. You know, most people on the ground don't be in connection with African Americans. It's like if I go to Harlem or Brooklyn or somewhere, they, you know, most people are like, I'm not African, you know, they don't see a connection. Um, so it's really up to the individual to manage their expectations, you know, to have a more realistic idea of what's happening in modern day African cities. Um, and then understand, like, what you need as a person. So even for me, I know people may not see me as a long-lost sister or cousin, but it doesn't matter. I know that I'm connected to this land. I know exactly. that I'm connected to these people. And exactly. um, that's what's important to me. You know, it doesn't really matter what they think. Just like um, in America, if, if, you know, at one point they considered us three-sixths of a human. So I know that I'm a whole human. I just like here, I know I'm of African descent. And I'm here more so for the feeling um, and the connection that I have to the place. So um, it's not so much of what other people think about me. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, I have managed those expectations. So I have um, a, a better time and a better experience. I haven't had that crash that most people have, and then they have to build back up. So 
um, I think that's something that's very important for people who think who are thinking about um, coming here. Caitlin, I could see you nodding there. I see all of our guests nodding there. Uh, Barrett, what did you want to say? So I, I guess a, a key thing from an American perspective as a country, we have a romanticized idea of foreign homelands. And when we talk about it as a nation of immigrants, and this extends to all Americans, you know, white Americans, Asian Americans, the idea of, you know, if you're Irish or Korean or whatever, there's a romanticized like connection to where you're from and as African Americans even though our immigration story is vastly different there's a yearning to have that romanticized connection to to Africa and and that is I think when you get to Africa and you now have the reality just like you have the reality if you go to any country that romanticized notion needs to kind of fall away and you have to do the legwork you have to know a lot about the continent the place you're going and all the all the dynamics so that you can fully immerse yourself in and i think they, he made a, a good point that for like the younger generation when they're going over there that's very they're very prone to have the romanticized ideas of what africa is and there's a culture shock and then you know the africans actually have to now you know get the americans to come to realize this is what the country is like this is what what's happening and i think the the sooner we can have a more realistic view of, of, of our struggle domestically and internationally with regards to Africa and the perspectives we need to have, the, the, the more capacity we'll have to thrive in whatever way we decide to, to go into Africa, whether, you know, which, which countries they are and the dynamics if that I happen can just there. Jump in. Mm -hmm. Kaylin? Yeah, if I could just jump in, I mean, if we're talking about students, um, you know, I, I don't think that the expectations should be super high on students coming to Africa, study abroad, to study abroad or, or whatever it is that they're doing. You know, like, I just think that's a bit unrealistic. I mean, I came here, at, I, I moved to Namibia at 26 years old. Um, and to be honest, you know, like it has, ta I, I've been here for, for, you know, over almost eight, eight, eight to nine years. And it has taken me a long time and it's still not perfect just for me to, you know, understand my feelings and, you know, continually manage my own expectations. So, you know, I really don't think that, you know, you're going to find, um, you know, this perfect African-American like um, adaptation or entrance into the African continent, particularly uh, with students. Um, I, I hope that you don't hold their, you know, hold them too high and just be patient with them, you know, because it really seriously is a process. Even for me, I came as an adult, you know, um, and I'm still learning every day, little things, big things. You know, it's just, it's really a process and it does take patience and it's not pretty all the time. And, um, you know, so, yeah. Right, real, real quick though, and I, I, totally, I totally agree that, you know, you could have certain expectations for students or, you know, adult professionals or whatnot, but the, the idea of building the connection to Africa, if we're building the, like, the, a strong connection, we have to get past the romanticized idea and, you know, really, Kind of, and, and the earlier that the African American community can do that, okay. regardless of you know whether you're a student or you're an, an adult, I think the better it will be if if your goal is to to visit Africa and have like a, a really vibrant connection with the continent. So like there's like an, an American uh, impediment as to how we perceive countries outside the United States and see it with you know a realistic perspective and not a romanticized one. And I think. America kind of indoctrinates us to have that romanticized mm -hmm. view. Um, so I'm glad you raised that. I, I want to bring I, this up. I, Malika, I, 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 will, I will go to you, uh, Lita, but I want to bring this up sure. because this is, raises a good point. Um, we're talking about this romanticized view, and we got some Africans from people on the continent because, of course, Africa is not a country, and, and we did get pushback from people online who said, remember, don't just call us Africans. We're very <laughs> diverse in who we are. Um, there's this quote. This is from the article featuring uh, you, Mohamida, and you write, you might not have electricity, but you won't get killed by the police either, talking about moving uh, to Ghana. We got pushback because this is one person out of Nigeria who says, the chances of people killing you in Nigeria is 8 out of 10. Please don't deceive yourself. Check the hashtag in SARS and reform police to verify real stories of police brutality in Nigeria. That's actually something we did a stream show about, so it is a real issue. But keeping that in mind, others are saying there is a privilege to being African-American on the continent. This is from Sahara Reporters, a news site, Passport Privilege and Black Guilt, Tales of an African-American Expat. And this is something our community definitely relates to. Abul says, I've been telling my African-American brothers and sisters that they are more privileged and protected as Americans in Africa. I'm going back to my home, Ethiopia, because I can be in a better position as a U.S.-educated Ethiopian than trying to find acceptance here. So that's a little pushback on that idea. Lita, I wanted to bring you in here. What, what are your thoughts? Sorry, is this me now? Sorry, I was... It is I you. Was, um, yeah. So what I want to just add to that point is 
you need to understand something. When African Americans come to South Africa and interact with other Black South Africans, they're kind of exceptionalized because of the social capital and like the soft power. You know, mm -hmm. you will have um, an, Af an African American engage with a Black a South African whose favorite TV show is Scandal, who can sing Jay Z lyrics off by heart, and like who has so much affinity to so much American Black American pop culture that they enjoy this privilege of cool that you know, obviously not afforded to other foreign national Africans. And so what I've noticed is how with that privilege, there's almost a, a, a responsibility to use your, if you want to come and like stay here and be part of the institution and part of the country, you have to use that sort of privilege you have as an American with the resources to try and better the place. Because to be honest, South Africa and like many other African countries, we have trust issues when it comes to foreigners coming into this space. Um, and so that's a point that I really want to make, that the privilege does exist, but the privilege needs to be used to combat certain inequities within the local space that you exist, in any way that you can, regarding skills or resources. So, Mohamida, I want yeah, to bring I, you I, in. I, I want to bring Mohamida on, on that point of privilege because we got this via YouTube, someone watching live. They said, Ghana made a law in 2001 allowing descendants of the diaspora to get citizenship and work. And here is what that looks like. It's the right of abode granted to people of African descent in the diaspora. Uh, so uh, there are others saying it's not just that easy. You have to have several documents um, and, and a little time frame for making sure that you can be a citizen there. But it is a welcoming uh, announcement. Mohamida, when you see that, do you recognize that there's a privilege to being welcomed to this country that's not necessarily your own? Um, I think there is a privilege of, you know, being an African-American. I mean, I do understand that um, just coming in with, you know, dollars or, you know, an American education, you know, I'm not going to, you know, act like that doesn't exist. But one of the great things about it is finally I can use my American nest, you know, and, right. and get the benefits because I'm not getting them at home. So finally, you know, I can, you know, they benefit me. So it is, um, you know, to my advantage. I don't like to, you know, I, I like to pretty much go um, as anonymous as I can. You know, if I don't talk, no one even knows that I'm American. And even if I do talk, they just assume that I'm probably Ghanaian who was educated abroad, and I love living um, in that anonymity, anonymity, however you say that word, you know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. So, um, you know, I, I know, but I have it in my back pocket. If I need to use it, I use it. I try not to because I want to just, you know, live as normally as possible. But, um, yeah, I'm definitely not going to deny that that exists. And I think, like the um, gentleman said in South Africa, it is um, – you know, it's a responsibility I need to do, and I try as, as much as I can, um, you know, to improve my environment, to improve, you know, just and also just give people a realistic view of what African Americans are, too, because I think that's the flip side. People romanticize African Americans. They see yeah. Beyonce and Jay-Z and rappers and things exactly. like that on TV, and they think that's what our life is, you mm -hmm. know, and I'm mm -hmm. like, no, it's not like that, you yeah. know, and so it's always a... Um, education that's happening on, on both sides. Right. Kaylin? Yeah, I, and I mean, on the flip side of that, I really do think that, you know, maybe Africans sometimes, or South Africans, I don't want to generalize the continent, but I'll speak to the, the South African on the panel. You know, don't forget that you guys also have a privilege, you know? I mean, there's serious power um, in, in knowing your tribe um, and, 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 and having the, growing up in the rich culture that you grew up in, you know? Like, like uh, uh, the young woman before me was saying, you know, like, it's not, don't don't also don't over romanticize um, Black American privilege, you know, because it's it's not like 100% uh, rosy. But I do hear what you're saying um, in terms of when we're on the continent. I mean, for me personally, I try to um, you know keep my privilege in check when I can, or stand up against my privilege when I can. Whether it's someone, uh, you know, saying like just recently, a guy said to me, "Oh, I want I want some uh, American sisters. I don't want any uh, Namibian women." And I was like, you know, like I, I checked him, you know, like that's mm -hmm. not okay. I mean may seem like a simple thing, but just 
there are many different ways. And, and you know, in terms of African Americans coming here and becoming entrepreneurs or whatever, and just right. keeping social uh, responsibility in mind. So there, there are definitely um, things that we should do. So knowing uh, your privilege, checking it, and making sure that you are aware of it. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to give a big thank you to all of our guests for this fascinating conversation and to our community for making it great. I'll end with this tweet from Bonche who says, I have land in Kenya to share with anyone willing to come to Africa. Our ancestors would be happy. Hashtag AJStream. See you online.